Hello, welcome to another edition of Diaspora Weekly. My name is Jermaine Nkrumah, and you're watching Diaspora Weekly. Uh, tonight, this morning, I have an amazing guest whom you'll very soon meet. Uh, it's not your usual, um, uh, but before we get to him, uh, let me tell you what is keeping us going here at DNT. Look at this, special ice water. Usually I take a sip. Let me, producer, can I take a sip? All right. Mmm, great stuff. You need to try it. Um, we also have uh, several people that make this thing happen, uh, but like we always do, before you meet my guests, we're going to go on a short break, and when we come back, you get to hear the jangle, which is Jermaine's angle, and then after that, you meet my guests. Stay tuned. <laughs> Very good. In today's jungle, um, our show here, we have a very popular show here called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and they discussed an issue. They were answering a question, is vigilante justice justifiable in Ghana? And some of the messages that we, they received, let me read one to you. A gentleman, I will only refer to him as Kwame, said, what is vigilante justice? Is it the same as what I term social or instant justice? Traditionally, if you are caught stealing, you pay instantly for the consequences. If that is vigilante justice, it's divine, nothing better. It protects society and eliminates injustice, corruption, and malpractice in the court. So, obviously, this person thinks vigilante justice is justifiable. But, Here's the question. What if we're wrong? What if I don't like you and I'm walking down uh, Medina Market or any market in Ghana and all I have to shout is, Ari, 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 and nobody asks any question and they start pouncing on you. And by the time we get to know the truth, you're either dead or you're extremely wounded. Is that the kind of society that we want? But then the other argument is this. If you call the police, there lies a whole string of trouble that you're going to go through. First of all, you would have to pay something. You have to feed the person who stole from you uh, uh, while they're in custody. I didn't know about this until a recent experience came out. So if, if something happens and if you report it to the police, you're going to lose more. But on the other hand, if you met out instant justice, that's also not good enough. So what are we supposed to do? It comes down to something very simple. If we're going to grow as a society, we have to look at all these things and, make, and correct them. Because we cannot leave them as is and just assume that, yeah, in Ghana, that's just how it is. That's not just how it is. We have innocent people that are killed over this. Remember a whole army sergeant was killed in the western region uh, due to um, mob justice, okay? And so if everybody, the whole world is talking about Ghana, they, uh, we are the biggest thing that's going on in Africa and everybody wants to come here. Do we really want a reputation of a place where we deliver instant justice without knowing all the facts? And if we don't do that and we call the police, then we're going to be subject to a whole lot of stress then we don't win. In the end, if either is not good enough, it's the criminal that loses. And plus, this gentleman talks about corruption and everything. How come the people who steal millions, we don't subject them to uh, instant justice, we take them to court. So if a guy steals $10 million, we take them to court and spend additional money back and forth. But if a guy steals five cities worth of chicken, we beat him to death. Is that a kind of society that we really want to have in Ghana? So for today's jungle, I want Ghanaians to start to think about all these things and see how we correct them. Because if we're going to go forward, it's, uh, the, the idea is to make our society better. For today, that's the jungle. We'll see you soon. 
We, we go to a big a break. When we come back, you meet my guests. <laughs> Cool, fresh and trendy with a new look Makes you feel real good, that refreshing vibe Satisfies you right just the way you like This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Today we are joined by an amazing young lady. Uh, the best way I can describe her is uh, she looks in her 20s, but she speaks like she's in her 60s. I was really amazed to meet her, spoke with her for about a couple of hours, felt like it was just for a few minutes. Please help me welcome Chantel, Christine Lachma. Did I pronounce it right? Lamia, yes. Lamia, yes. very Thank good. You very much. From Dortmund, Germany. Right, yes. Wow. How are you? I'm good. I'm happy to be here today. Very happy. Very um, good. It's my pleasure. So okay. Thank you very much. German, the only German that I remember, uh, I think if I say it, your boyfriend will be angry at me. <laughs> it's Ich liebe dich. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that, most common one everyone knows. That, that's right, yes. that's right. But uh, you've decided to move to Ghana. Um, yes, I've uh, taken that big decision, a huge leap of faith. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I've decided to relocate to Ghana. All right, so why don't you tell us about yourself? Well, first, let's get to know you. Who <laughs> is Chantel? So, um, as you mentioned, I'm in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. I was born and raised in Germany. Um, I have a Ghanaian mother and a German dad. So I was brought up in a household with both um, cultural backgrounds. Um, I'm the second of four, mm -hmm. four born and studying international business and management. Okay. And yeah, I have a huge, huge, huge passion for traveling in Ghana. Okay. And um, have tried to come around as much as possible. Every time I come, I always try to move around and not stay in Accra. So um, yeah, that's one so of So where are some of the uh, places that you've been that are interesting? So interesting. Last week, actually, I traveled to Takrade, mm -hmm. um, used the opportunity to go all the way to Inzolenzu to visit where? In Zolenzu, okay. yeah. It's okay. like 90 kilometers further from Takade. Okay. That's the village on stilts, right? Okay, really yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, really amazing experience. Um, I've been to the north for the first independence uh, celebration okay. there okay. in 2019. Okay, that's good. yeah. That was 2019. Yeah, amazing experience. Um, been to the Volta region, climbed Afajato. So I've you come. You what? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, I've tried to come around as much. Yeah, as it looks like you have a thing for mountains. Um, because I there's a picture of you on a mountain in Greece, yes, exactly. I okay. mean, I t I'm, I'm quite adventurous, and okay. um, uh, you know, there's when it comes to traveling, I just want to be out there, I want to see it, I want to experience it. Um, mostly it's unplanned, okay. Um, Afajat was planned, yeah, but um, we visited some caves, for example. I ended up climbing around in slippers and stuff, it okay. was very spontaneous. Okay, so, um, yeah, I always try to be on the move. Always Have you try. lived all your life in Germany? Because, um, most Germans born and raised would not speak English the way <laughs> you do. Okay, so, um, brought up in the household that I was brought up in. My mom used to speak English with us a lot, okay, right? Okay. But I was always used to responding in German. So my English, my understanding was really good, but my speaking was okay. And um, after school, I decided to move to UK for a year for okay. some work experience and was unsure about what I would want to study. So my parents said, you know, go out there, try and up your English skills maybe a little bit, get some experience and... Um, yeah, I think that's where I really learned how to speak English and be confident in English. 
as you oh. said, Germans are not. Um, yeah. I mean, we try, we try, but usually our accent is very harsh and it clashes there with the English. When I was in Germany, there was this joke that uh, to tell you how long ago it was. It was uh, the German Chancellor was Helmut Kohl. Oh yes. Okay. And Quite some years ago. The Brit UK um, uh, Prime Minister was Ma Margaret Thatcher. And the president of the United States was Ronald Reagan. This is and quite some time. my friend, my German friends were teasing about the way Germans speak English. Yeah. They said that these three leaders went to Russia to go and visit Yuri Andropov, who was there. And they were standing in the rain, and the rain beat them because Andropov was late to come and receive them. Mm. <laughs> and so when Andropov came, uh, Reagan was. Uh, I mean, no, uh, Andrew Pope was waiting for them. So Reagan was like, oh, I'm so sorry, Yuri. And uh, Margaret Thatcher was like, oh, yeah, me too. And then Hermit Cole was, uh, 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 me three. <laughs> <laughs> See, <laughs> no, usually our understanding is okay. But, okay. you know, the speaking is a bit harsh. So, so I get where it's coming but, from. But I, I know, even <laughs> if you hadn't, I think you, you might have picked it up in uh, UK because if, if, Typical German English is, it will come with a bit of a, a German accent. Yes, yeah, right? so my siblings, for example, we are all eloquent in English, right? Okay. We all speak English. because That's my from mom, your mom. From my mom's side, yeah. Even my dad is, can speak English. English. Um, but it's just to a certain extent. So, what's the you know? dominant language in your household? Oh, I think. Uh, yeah, German and English makes that really depends on the mood. Okay. Um, before, I never used to express myself in English, but even now when I get into a conversation, it switches. So what, because what now happened to Chi? Ooh, okay, my understanding in Chi is very poor. Okay. Um, to no fault of your own because it wasn't spoken at home. Yes, because it was, we just never spoke Chi at home. We had English and German If at your home. mom spoke Chi, what would happen? You respond in what? Ooh, I think depending on what the topic is, you know. <laughs> so usually now when I get, when the conversation is a bit more emotional maybe, mm -hmm. um, I used to, I start speaking English. But when it's German, it's mostly like maybe discussing political matters or, you know, where the vocabulary is a bit more complex probably. Mm -hmm. But I try. And also a lot of my friends are English speaking. A lot of people in UK, a lot of people in Ghana, they all speak English. So... Um, it's no problem. And even when you travel abroad, you know, you always have to speak English. Like you mentioned Greece, for example. Yeah. You deal with everyone in English. English that's, okay. You just pick out bits and pieces and then... So the Greater German there. Society, how yes. do you fit in? When I was there, Germany was very white. And that was before my time. Yeah, even. this was back in 84, 85. Yeah. But, but how, how, how is it now for a mixed race young lady such as you? Um, so I would say Germans are quite receptive when it comes to foreigners just in general, right? Um, I would say they try as much. Um, we pr they, I would want to say they, but I'm also partly German. So we promote includes. In Inclusivity, like mm -hmm. we try to include different nations and whatsoever. But obviously, when you uh, live in a country for quite some time and you look around you and everyone always looks different and you don't really seem to fit in, um, you do recognize that you're different, right? Usually, I forget most of the times, but people around you will obviously make you not forget that, hey, you don't look like us. Yeah. Sometimes in a positive, sometimes in a negative way. But um, you will be reminded from time to time. I remember when I used to go to school back in the days, maybe when I was like 13, 14, 15 years old, um, the area that my school was in was mostly white people, right? Okay. So um, as a kid, you know, kids are noisy. They'll ask you questions. They'll come touch your hair. They'll say, oh, what do your parents look like? You know, oh, where are you actually from? And... You know, yeah. some of them are just really interested. In innocent. Inno it's a very innocent questions, but you will be reminded that um, yeah, yeah. you look different, well, you know, yeah, and yeah. that is... Uh, and, and with kids, when they, it, it's maybe they they're innocently want to know, but there will be a couple of them who will use that as a bully uh, thing. Yeah. Were you ever bullied? I was never... No, I don't, I don't say... I, I wouldn't say that I was ever bullied for something, mm -hmm. no. Um, obviously, when you go through puberty, especially as a young girl, you go through certain, um, like certain topics are quite, you know, sensitive. are quite sensitive, yeah. So um, I think I, I definitely had a phase. I remember that was back in the days with my best friend. We fully went through a whole phase where I felt like, mum, 
my hair i hate it like <laughs> yeah, yeah it like I, I when i straighten it it goes puffy again like certain features of yourself yeah. you fully try you to wanted neglect to them. fit in and you were young yes. and you know puberty and as a young girl you always want to fit in like yeah. at some point you're like no i'm not different like yeah. we're all one you know yeah. but um as you grow older obviously you learn to love every single part of yourself and now being different um makes me feel Okay. Good, you know, makes me feel very, very w good. With so. what you said about Germany, yes. something just, you know, occurred to me. You know, Germany has a very bad history with this Hitler and Nazi thing. We do, okay. yeah. For them to travel, it seems like they've traveled very far away from it. If you, in your words, they're very receptive to foreigners and everything. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the reason for that? Now, before you answer that, I want to just pose this question to the United States. Yeah. It's also had a bad history of slavery and even they've gone as far as civil war and the good guys won. 200 years, well, several uh, centuries later, they're still having come to grips with people who look different. Yeah. What is the difference? What is that? Why, does, why do Germans get it but Americans don't? So I would say racism and discrimination in any form mm -hmm. is definitely very much present mm -hmm. in Germany, right? As it is in probably every country. Mm -hmm. um, I've only been to the States once mm -hmm. and I cannot really speak on any personal experience, you mm -hmm. know, when it comes to that. But obviously you watch the news, you see what's happening even, you know, last year, you see mm -hmm. um, what kind of what kind of stress they go through, especially mm -hmm. people of color. Mm -hmm. um, in Germany, I would say it's very much different. You also receive racism, but um, not as harshly, probably. It's not being put in your face directly. I would say um, when it comes to people of color, the racism is very subtle sometimes. And um, you almost sometimes don't really recognize it that someone is taking a jab at you, right? Yeah. Um, my younger brother, for example, he's told me this uh, several times, and he always gets upset. Um, we have a really big train station in Dortmund, right? Mm -hmm. And in the morning, he would just be on his way to work, he would be listening to music, and then he would get stopped by the police, and they would ask him in English for his papers, mm -hmm. right? And he so what does that imply? What yeah. does that imply? Yeah. Based on just your outer appearance, what yeah. does that imply? Must be probably some random yeah. foreigner, some refugee who's and when running he around. Well, does he respond in English or in German? Well, his German is on point, okay. and he doesn't really get bothered with these kind. Of, he just gets annoyed, you know. And yeah. then he comes and tells me, "Oh, like, why this? Why does this keep on <laughs> happening to me?" You know. Okay. So they profile you definitely. Yeah. But but I, but I think I found the answer mm -hmm. when I looked at the numbers, um, the demographics. Mm -hmm. Caucasians are 87% of the German population. True. In we contrast, it's 62% back in the United States. Yeah. So could it be that you are not a threat yet in Germany? In fact, black people don't even register in the demographic this thing. So it's like we're 87%. This is our country. You're just mm. here. So whereas in America, They've elected a black president, and then, so there's yes. whoa, you know. I mean, looking at the, the looking at the demographics, yes, but I mean, um, you like there are families who have been in who have lived in the U.S. for generations and generations. Mm -hmm. I do not know a single Ghanaian family, for example, who can count like let's say four or five or six generations of history in Germany. Mm -hmm. So with um, my mother, for example, yeah. she relocated to Germany when she was my age, okay. right? Whereas in the US, you fully have like generations that have relocated and have been in the States ever since. So I think demographic wise, yes, it makes sense. But also looking at the history, our history was very much different. You can't right. really compare both right. of that. But right. um, it's just something that occurred to me when he said yeah. uh, Germans are, and, and you read the news, whereas yeah. most countries are rejecting um, immigrants, Germans say bring them in. Exactly. Which incidentally used to be the American posture with the Statue of Liberty. True. Give me your tired, your <laughs> hungry and all that, yes, but now it's all true. changed. True. So let's talk about the German society. Um, you, you've told us about how you you know, sometimes feel different and everything. But what about the African diaspora in Germany? Are you together? 
So um, looking at Ghanaians in Germany, right, uh, just looking at the numbers, uh, I stay in the western part of Germany in North Rhine-Westphalia and um, I think the sec that's like the second biggest, I don't want to say hotspot, but most of the Ghanaians are in Hamburg and then right. comes North Rhine-Westphalia. Right. And um, looking at how North Rhine-Westphalia is also um, structured, we have lots of big cities right next to each other. Like so Dusseldorf. Exactly. Yeah, Dusseldorf and Dortmund are in the same state. Right? Exactly. Okay. So we're like in the same region. So, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's big cities like Dortmund, let's say Dusseldorf, Essen, Duisburg, we're all kind of in the same area. So it's quite easy to stay connected. And that is something I really appreciate about our okay. region. Um, in Hamburg, I've been to Hamburg only once in my life. Um, there's also a very, very, very big um, group of Ghanaians, right? But it is very easy to stay connected. Usually, okay. even if you, let's say you go to Berlin, you go to Hamburg, you go to any other place, you always know somebody, whether that's your distant cousin, whether that's someone you know from church, you're always connected. And most of the Ghanaians I also know, mostly are connected through church, honestly. Okay. So what about through parties? Uh, a party, obviously, yes, as well, and you stuff go to like Ghanaian that. You parties? Um, not anymore, not as much. Well, you, you, <laughs> what Ghanaian dance can you do? Oh, Lord, please don't ask my dancing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> always you try and stay up to well, date. I mean, this, place, this place is Oh, well, I was about to please. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my dancing is um, is, is, is. Can you dance solid. hip life? I mean, when it comes to Ghana, obviously, when you go out, uh -huh. you uh, What about that door? You dance. You know, okay. <laughs> no, I'm asking you all these questions because no. I'm gonna. Your your mom is gonna hear it from me. She's yeah. gonna. <laughs> she yes. she needs to teach you how to dance there. No, as dance. for the hip life, uh -huh. my mom used to blast that music every Saturday. When you know hip life was playing on a Saturday, mm -hmm. every Ghanaian kid in every Ghanaian house, or at least from where I come from, knows it's time to get up and start cleaning. So hip life has really okay. hip life is a big part. I've been okay. we've been listening to hip life ever since. That's good. But obviously when you go out you connect, you know, on a social side, through church, family. So we are very connected. Yeah. Do very your parents connected. do you the, your your age group, your generation? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and by the way, we we also need to look at the Nigerians because I know there's a huge Nigerian people play. Do you have like your generation versus the generation, how they do things to embarrass you. Because in the United States, it's a big thing. We, the older generations, are supposed to be, everything we do is embarrassing to the kids among them. I understand. Them. Do you have that in Germany? <laughs> so, I think it really depends. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I think we take that kind of side with a bit more of humor nowadays. Okay. I mean... I can show you our family group chat. Like, we will fully see, like, memes and stuff. I'll send into the group. Mm -hmm. My mom and my brothers will laugh about it, how African parents used to do this and this and that. And everyone can relate to it. Everyone who has an African parent right. can relate to it. So we take it with a bit more of humor, I think. And we are more... It's like our parents nowadays, I think, with the newer generations, are more inclined to also break certain things. I wouldn't say generational curses, but certain things that we know we've carried from one generation to another that are just not bringing us anything so not really embarrassed i would say but we are oh, more there's more I'm of a gonna conversation dig further. before we go on a break <laughs> we're gonna one more question i'm sure you, you see your father is german so probably the german society he sinks into the mm -hmm. but I, I can see where your mom being a Ghanaian immigrant in germany uh, behaviorally uh, among your friends who do things and they're like, Mom, don't do that. <laughs> Okay, yeah, you have a point. Yeah, you have a point. What, one example. Um, okay, one thing that my mom used to do, <laughs> and she knows this, one thing that my mom used to do, you know when um, you are supposed to come to school, um, I think twice a year with your parents and they discuss your grades of teachers and that. So my mom is a very proud Ghanaian as well. And I mean, as you grow older, you really feed into that African mm -hmm. identity. But as you are younger, certain things you just wouldn't really understand. Mm -hmm. And my mom would fully come, you know, and it's easy. You know, Germans, you just come after work. Some dad will pass by. Parents will come and just quickly have a conversation. My mom would fully dress wear, like, up. not dress up, <laughs> but, like, African, you know, kente top and beats and everything. <laughs> and she would always speak English with me in front of other people. And I felt like a show off, right? Okay. So I was like, Mom, you know how to speak German. Can we, just, <laughs> can we you know? And she was very. 
<laughs> now I'm really happy. And when usually she goes with my young, my sister is 10 years younger than me. Now when she goes um, with my sister, I tell mom, wear the whole outfit, everything, wear the beats and whatever. Okay, now but you appreciate now it. Now I appreciate <laughs> it. But when you're younger, you're like, oh, Lord, like my English teacher. Mm -hmm. My mom used to come and fully speak English. And I'm like, mom, you, you, why are you doing this? This yeah. is showing <laughs> off, you know. But as you grow older, you appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you appreciate All it. All right, we're going to go on a quick break. When we come back, we're bringing Chantel home. This is Diaspora Weekly. Stay, stay tuned. As the national regulator of the communications industry in Ghana, the National Communications Authority seeks to ensure an environment that is safe and fair for consumers and service providers. NCA grants licenses and authorizations for operation of communication systems and services, develops guidelines to streamline communication activities, establish and monitor quality of service indicators for operators and service providers. NCA is in eight regions Nakra, Tamale, Takradi, Kumar. Ho, Kufaridra, Sunyani, and Bolgatanga. Do you have unresolved complaints with the service providers? Contact us on 0800-110662-0307-011419 between the hours of 8 o'clock a.m. and 5 o'clock p.m. from Monday to Friday or visit our website at www.nca.org.gh and follow the procedure for filing a complaint or submitting inquiry. National Communications Authority Communications for Development. Hello and welcome back. This is Diaspora Weekly. My name is Jermaine. I'm joined by Chantel Christine Lachmere, right? And I want you to, uh, for, for those of you who are watching, you're watching now because can, you can catch us on TV, but uh, be sure to download our app, DNT Ghana, both on the Google Play Store and the Apple Store. Um, either on Android or iOS these days, you can get us on both platforms. You download our app, DNT Ghana. You can watch us anywhere on the planet that you find yourself. Chantel, you, um, we, we've been talking about life in Germany, mm -hmm. but you've made the decision to come to Ghana. Mm -hmm. Why? What prompted that decision? Um, okay, where do I start? I think it was, um, it came gradually, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've been coming to Ghana ever since I was a young kid. Okay. Yeah. Every now and then with my family. You usually come, you visit your family here. Um, you have a couple of cousins that take you around, but it was always a holiday kind of trip. Um, in 2019, I made the decision to come here for an internship for three months. So living in Ghana is very much different to coming for a holiday in Ghana. And um, I came, I stayed here, I did an internship at the diaspora office. Mm -hmm. um, and you said you had an amazing time. Oh yes, yes, it was, a really, it was a really good time. I mean, the internship itself was really rewarding, mm -hmm. but it, always, it, it, it also gave me kind of um, an impression of what it would be like mm -hmm. to live here, to okay. go about your daily activities, to work, to move around. And it was, in the beginning, I never knew I was able to reach certain limits that mm -hmm. I reached, right? Okay. Now, living in Germany and living in, with parents, with siblings, you know, in your social circle now you've established your whole life, is very much different to now relocating and going about your everyday life here. But I learned a lot, a okay. lot, um, did personally. You ever, did you ever work in Germany? Oh yes, yes, of course. I mean, um, alongside studies, I've okay. always been working, yeah. yeah. So I've worked experience in the UK, Germany, and then in Ghana. So what differences do you find with the experience you've had? I mean, some would say if you work at a diaspora office, the standard, the work ethics and everything is almost like uh, back in Germany. So you may, it may not present you with a true picture. Yes. But was there, were there any differences that you saw? I mean, you see differences, obviously, with the people that you surround yourself with as well. Mm -hmm. um, there are some differences. <coughs> I think work ethic-wise as well, you will always find... The, I even saw differences in the United Kingdom and then in Germany. So then also working in an office in Ghana was very much different. So work ethic, I think, is, is 
you know, can you, you cannot really compare it, especially when you look at Germans. We Gem we love to work. And our work ethic Germans is... Germans are the workaholics We of the world. love to yeah. work. And we take our work really serious, as okay. in um, not only what we're working on, but your whole work attitude. So um, let's say coming to work on time, um, not missing any deadlines, also working ahead. Like we are working machines. So bringing that kind of motivation and then also working here was definitely an advantage, I would say. Um, so yeah, there are some slight differences, definitely. For example, I, in Germany, I think if you say um, you're working from, let's say, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., like two minutes to five, everyone will start packing their things. By five, you're out. That's it. Whereas in Ghana, it was more like, I need to get A, B, and C done in a day, and I will leave when this is done, right? Maybe there are closing hours in other offices as well, yeah, but it's more like you get the workload done, you close your day, and then you leave. And also sometimes traffic, you know? So that should, that can be good for Ghana then. In other words, if it takes me to 6 p.m. to finish, I'll stay and finish it. So are you saying that, that what you saw is that was a result-oriented weather right, compared to time of work? So... I mean, we were working on, on different projects, right? And I saw at some days, if the workload, workload is just not as much and there is legit nothing to do, on other days, it's okay to stay a bit longer. And that is, uh, that is all right. Whereas in Germany, I would say, at least from my work experience, mm -hmm. it rarely happens that you just decide, okay, um, there's not much to do and I've got four hours left. I'll just leave early. That is not possible you, you cannot no you can't if your contract says you're supposed to work till five then you work to five or maybe you have some kind of um verbal agree not even verbal agreement but it's part of your contract that you can maybe leave earlier but you won't, will not get paid yeah. for the hours that you're not there okay. whereas here it's more like um okay we have an early start tomorrow we finished everything for today let's close two hours earlier it's absolutely no problem you, you can do that okay. yeah so so when you as you're coming in I mean, you've been here long enough. Take us outside of the workplace, out in the public, traffic, yeah. behaviorally, and the way people... Um, for some of us who were born and raised here, even when we come back, it's a challenge. For you who True. were born and raised there, uh, do you feel like you're mentally ready? Um, mentally ready? To, to be confronted by... Uh, public uh, behavior that's clearly going to be different from uh, how it is in Germany? So, obviously, going about your everyday life, mm -hmm. structures are very much different, mm -hmm. right? Certain things that um, I sometimes say I would miss or I would appreciate more in Germany, maybe these things do not exist here and vice versa. It goes both ways. Now... I can tell that sometimes you do get a bit frustrated, especially with um, like the smallest things. Sometimes you get really, really irritated. But I've learned that when, for example, you travel to any other country, there's a certain kind of attitude, certain kind of behavior where you somewhat excuse minor things. Oh, it's different. You know, this is not home. So what I've stopped doing personally is comparing because there's absolutely no point. Mm -hmm. um, both countries are very much different. And by comparing and saying, oh, in Germany you do this, it does not get you anywhere. So you really need to stop <coughs> comparing. But you do get frustrated. frustrated. Yeah, sometimes you do, definitely. Somebody told me that, like, let's take you for example. Mm -hmm. If you leave Germany and you went to Russia, and you find behaviors that are very, even though I think German and Russia are pretty close. Let's say you go to uh, Jamaica, mm -hmm. right? You see things that are different. You're like, oh, yeah, Jamaica, I read about it. That's how they are. There's no personal connection there. Mm -hmm. But with Ghana, you're always going to have that sentimental thing. I, I, I don't know how you avoid comparing. Yes. Because for me, it's like, no, Ghanaians are better than this. Yeah. No, this yes, is unacceptable. Yes. I understand. Whereas the, the foreigner, the Chinese guy, the, he came here with a mindset that, oh, Africans are like this, yes. so nothing could surprise me. I understand. And so which of those mindsets do you come in with? Um, so I've, 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 what you just spoke about, the kind mm -hmm. of sentimental, the kind of emotional bonds that you have mm -hmm. with Ghana, I've seen it with my mom, for example, or mm -hmm. with um, other people that I travel with to Ghana, right? 
it's like we know what we're able to do and um we get frustrated somewhat with our own people mm -hmm. right um you don't really have that kind of connection like you mentioned with other people but yeah. i still think when you come the same kind of patience and the same kind of um understanding you have for other nations when you travel because me i've been to a couple of countries and you know people complain about random stuff but mm -hmm. i feel like it's usually our own people that are the harshest on on Ghanaians, mm -hmm. you know so for the same reason i just mentioned yes yeah, so you like. sh the same patience and the same kind of um understanding and the same attitudes that you carry with to other countries mm -hmm. come and bring that same attitude i know it's hard i know it's really hard it is hard because maybe, i know I, like let me take myself okay yes. born and raised in ghana mm -hmm. lived the better part of my life in the united states mm -hmm. when i come to ghana and i see things i have this itch to correct I things. i know yes I whereas know. if i were to go to rome right now I don't care what they do. I, yes. I'm here for either to do business and go back. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to change Rome. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just here for the purpose and leave. Mm -hmm. So that, if, if people don't understand, that is the difference. If a mm -hmm. Chinese guy, European, American, French, come in here to make money, that's the focus. I'm coming to make money. I'm mm -hmm. not coming to change Ghana. Whereas we Ghanaians that go and come back and say, no, this one, ah, Ghana, we're better than this. We need yeah. to change. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. And I think pe people should understand the difference so that they don't think we're stuck up. They would do the same thing. In fact, I would say this. <coughs> if you grew up in, say, where did you go? The village on stills? In Zulenzu. Zulenzu. Mm -hmm. If you grew up there and you left to come to Accra, to live here for an extended period of time, right? When you go back to Zulunzu and you see people doing certain things, you're gonna wanna, no, man, this is no good. Because you have I that understand. personal bond. But I think <laughs> there's two ways to go about this, mm -hmm. right? You can either complain about it and nag about it and say, mm -hmm. this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this is not good. Or you use it as a learning experience. And you, sometimes, me, I've, I've been in situations like that. Me, for example, I get, very often very irritated by customer service for example now when i see an opportunity to even i don't want to say educate but to even give an advice and mm -hmm. to say you know what um come here quickly next time how about you do things this and this and that way it's not a massive impact but you're speaking to one person and you don't even know who that person is going to do in the future like try and use it as a learning experience because there's potential right we come here and we see so many problems. This doesn't work. This doesn't work. But that also means there's potential for us to change it. And do you know what so, you just did? That is, uh, you said, you, there's a difference there. You said, in that experience, that uh, example that you say, mm -hmm. you say, come here. Hey, how about so and so and so? Mm -hmm. It's in the way you put it. How exactly. about you're suggesting to the person. Exactly. Whereas others will go, no, don't do it like this. You should do, do, do. No. And then people become defensive. So yeah. that's why I think it's all about the approach. There are problems, many yeah. problems, and we all know that. Yeah. Especially when coming from very westernized countries, you mm -hmm. know. We come from a society where a lot of things are already established, a lot of things are flowing and working, and we're used to that. And now you come to a different country where maybe a lot of things that you took for granted that work mm -hmm. are not even fully developed yet. We yeah. all know, but what, does it, what are you gaining from complaining? Yeah. This, if you cannot change it, leave it move on but if you see an opportunity where you can say you know what hey come here quickly because i had an incident like that and i said you know what come here um i've been in a similar situation like you before do you know what i did i did this and this and that try this next time trust me it'll work for you and they leave with a smile and it's a genuine advice mm -hmm. right this whole complaining and saying oh this doesn't work this doesn't work okay it will not get us anywhere that's right. my approach okay. to things that's so you, it, it seems like you're coming in with a, a very brilliant attitude that's going to work i'm trying um the next uh, place that i want you to touch on is leadership in africa mm -hmm. um angela merkel she's been the vice uh, i mean she's been the chancellor for how long now quite a while over eight years eight years yes oh i thought it'd been longer than that but but there's a system that changes. And for here in Ghana, we're also very fortunate. True. That we're, but unfortunately, you see in other countries, Uganda, they just had an election where a I'm man that's it. 500 years old just won again. Right. He's been there for 35 years. 
And if you see him, you can tell this man is no longer good it's for no this country. It's no longer good, true. Um, the same in Cameroon. A lot of these people don't want to leave. Why? W what's your impression of leadership in Africa? So I think there is a lot of leadership potential that is going to waste. A lot of leadership potential that we're not tapping into. Mm -hmm. Because Ghana has had great leadership in the past, and mm -hmm. we currently also have. But I think because of certain factors, mm -hmm. um, let's mention one, let's say, let's say corruption, for example, is a really, really big issue in our countries. Mm -hmm. And it comes in very different forms and shapes. But all these little distractions take away great leadership from us, is what I think. Um, the younger generations, the one that are upcoming now, the one that have maybe also been exposed to great leadership, for example, in the diaspora, you know, mm -hmm. um, are really a great, a great source of, of, of people who can really push and direct us maybe in the right, in the right direction. Because mm -hmm. you've seen it already. You come from a place where things are already working, they are established, and you see how things can work, right? So now when you come back home, for example, and you try and teach these kind of things and you say, hey, you know what? I've learned to this and this and that way. And you leave that kind of um, mindset. That's where I think progress can come, okay. right? But we do have the potential, definitely, right. 100%. I mean, um, most people point to leaders. For me, I point to the people. Mm -hmm. um, at the, for, for one reason, the leaders are selected from the people mm -hmm. and they come in with the same attitude it cannot be that the people are saints and the politicians are devils mm -hmm. I, I can't accept that nor vice versa i think mm -hmm. there is some in both but um it when you when you look at ghana right now mm -hmm. and you look at the trajectory that we're going on where do you see this country five to ten years from now oh. um so, and I have this discussion every now and then with mm -hmm. some friends of mine. I think I'm very optimistic mm -hmm. when it comes to progress in Ghana. Okay. Um, a lot of friends who have lived here their whole lives say, Chantel, even our great-grandchildren are not going to see that progress. But I really think and I, I'm going to emphasize on that every single time. And that is so something you're optimistic? That, oh, very optimistic. What is the basis for your optimism? Let me, it's the work that I did. Right? Okay. It's the people that I was exposed, the conversations that I had and the potential that I've seen, right? You see how, for example, in 2019 with the year of return, how Ghana has really been put on the map. Maybe you don't really see all these small, small little progresses, but people are really turning their direction and looking at Ghana. Like, right, we have the attention right now. And it's a momentum that is not supposed to be missed. Okay. So when you look at, um, not maybe the whole country, but small little sectors that are ongoing, and also agendas that are being pushed, mm -hmm. you will definitely see progress uh, looking back, definitely. Okay. I mean, you can, you can ask our parents, for example, how was Ghana 30, 40 years ago? Is there a change? Looking back, you will see that there's a change, definitely. The, now, the question is, those in my old, my, my uh, yes, we have mobile phones now, we mm. can text technology, but behaviorally, my, my generation will tell you that we've gone the other way. Because you have young people who can openly insult adults. Yeah. We didn't have that. Mm. Okay, so it, it's a mixed thing. But I want to get back to, before we go on a quick break, I want to get back to where you worked. Mm -hmm. Some will say that's not a good barometer. Because you worked with diasporans at the office of the president. Mm. That is not a good barometer. If you were working in an obscure office, on a field in Sunyani thereabouts. True. And they're not used to members of the diaspora. Mm -hmm. Would your experience have been the same? And would you have been just as optimistic? So I cannot really say what my experience would have been like, maybe yeah. working less in another region, maybe in the private sector somewhere. I can only speak on behalf of what I've experienced, okay. right? And um, also on personal interactions with people. Okay. And what I've ex been imposed, uh, what I have been exposed to so far, and I've, I'm I'm being told very often that oh I'm too optimistic and oh no this is never going to happen, but um, 
I really see a very, very big potential in the diaspora coming home. So Let me tell you. that is why. With I the optimism department, you have one person also in that department. That's me. I'm very optimistic about Ghana. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you why. We're going to talk about why Ghana has a great potential. Because when we come back, we're going to talk about young people who constitute a huge majority of the population. And they're educated, they're smart, they just need an opportunity. We're going to talk about that in the next segment. Stay tuned. This is Diaspora Weekly. Traffic everywhere, wasting people's time. When are you getting back to us? Time is money. And then Energy you are. <laughs> it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Only on DNT. Hello and welcome back. This is Diaspora Weekly. My name is Jermaine Nkrumah and I'm joined by Chantel Lachma. Hey, pronounce it again for me. <laughs> All right. Chantel Christine uh -huh. Lamia. Lamia. Okay. Yes. Why, why, why am correct. I trying to put the H in there? Because I thought... Usually, it happens to me quite a lot when I go abroad. You oh, know, really? the, the H, yeah. Lachme, it like, happens quite often, yeah. But don't you one. don't pronounce that, right? No. Okay. Very soft. Very, very good. Um, you are a millennial. What, what age group are you? Are you a millennial or Z? What Those generations, wh which one do you belong so to? So I'm in the late 90s, right? That's late 97. 90s. Uh, uh. So that's millennial. Millen yeah, so part I thought the millennials ended in 96 or 95, thereabout. So you're on the sure. top. No, I, th I think Generation Z starts at two thousand. Generation Z. Oh, Generation it starts after two thousand. Okay. I'm not. Don't well, quote me on that, but that's fine. From what you I are all the young people. <laughs> yes, yes. And yes. my thing is, I want young people, young Africans all over the mm -hmm. world. What is your view of Africa? Can Africa count on you? Africa. Um, we're speaking a whole continent, yes. right? Yes. Okay. And we're speaking Africans. The reason why now, I'm asking that, chances are, look, I'm looking at you, mm -hmm. uh, born and raised in Germany with links to Ghana. Mm -hmm. There's someone in New Zealand, born and raised in, I uh, mean, with links to Kenya. Somebody mm -hmm. in Canada linked to Uganda. So, you know, that's your group. Mm -hmm. Can Africa count on you or you look at life from the perspective of where you live. In other words, that's where you're going to make your life. Okay. I, d I don't really know how it is for other countries and how um, receptive they are towards also diasporans and, and, and young people, right? Um, as for Ghana, and I, and I know other West African countries as well, um, we do try and tap into that, right? Because the future is what we are basically the, the future. future of this country. Because even the leaders and all that, like at some point, we're all going to take over mm -hmm. all these positions and mm -hmm. fill them. So um, I don't really know. I, I don't want to speak on a whole continent. And um, I don't want to speak on, I, like, I know situations look different in other countries. I, had, I just had a friend of mine. So let's talk visit. about Ghana. Yeah, you, I want to talk about Ghana you, you because in other your, countries. You and your friend, like your brother, your, your siblings, mm -hmm. are all Ghana related. Do you know, do you have other Ghanaian uh, young people such as yourself in Germany that you talk with, mm -hmm. right? When you talk, do you talk about Africa or yeah, do you talk about... Let's talk, yeah, because as for Ghanaians, I can tell. Yeah. So um, most of my most of my Ghanaian friends, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've all been coming to Ghana ever since you we were kids mm -hmm. um, multiple times. So we know the country to some extent, right? Um, what I've recognized over the last couple of years is that everyone at some point in time has an interest to somehow start something in Ghana. So everyone is somehow, you know, looking for something, looking for a reason to keep on coming back, not only for holiday, but to have some kind of connection and to really start something, right? People are buying lands, are building properties, like are really finding grounds to stand on when they come to Ghana. 
And also, when it comes to entrepreneurship, spirits run really, really high in this country. I just saw this post a couple of days ago saying that um, Ghana is ranked one of the highest countries in the world with women being entrepreneurs, yes. which is really remarkable. Right. So um, everyone usually tries to find something and to start a business that keeps you coming back to Ghana so that you don't only come for enjoyment, you don't come for, for December, you don't come for holiday, so that you really have something here that makes you some kind but of income. To put it in context, mm -hmm. the, the, the numbers may not tell the story, and I'm not trying to douse that rep the effect of that report. Mm -hmm. In Ghana, you see a lot of women in buying and selling, which means they're entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And it's important that you don't view that entrepreneurship in that report as a woman CEO of this organization. Or sure. that, you know. So mm -hmm. that's where that report comes from. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk back on when you are coming to Ghana, mm -hmm. you already have people your age who have finished college and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm playing the devil's advocate here. Mm -hmm. They will say, no, stay there. You're coming to take our jobs. What do you say to them? To be honest, I've, I've, I haven't gotten this kind of response yet. Okay. Um, some people, some people tell me, oh no, don't don't move to Ghana. Ghana is stressed. Ghana is stressed. But then you look at their work of field, and maybe you understand. Mm -hmm. But looking at my peers, like people in my age group, I've never had someone say to me, don't come to Ghana because you're going to steal our jobs or you're going to now. Nah. They're really Your peers over there? No, right. peers over there and here. And here, okay. Yes, we're okay. quite open to come somehow bridge both countries and okay. make that connection. That's very interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. So I'd like to elaborate on that. So you're mm -hmm. saying that your peers back in Germany and back here, they don't have any problem with you coming back. They actually appreciate you coming back. That's by the fact that when you look at the numbers, for every, if you came in to... to uh, pick up a job mm -hmm. rather than bring something entrepreneurship here. Mm -hmm. Chances are you'll be taken by. But you saying that your 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 age group they don't have any problem with that. I haven't had a single conversation where someone told me, "Oh, don't come because you're going to steal our places or something okay. like that." No, people even try to um, collaborate, try to find like a, a trend or maybe try to find a niche that they can tap into. Whether that's into starting a business, exporting. Um, you know, re people are really looking into that, but I haven't, at, at least not amongst my age group, I haven't had that response yet where they say, oh, don't come. Like I said, the only response I've gotten is, Santa, why do you want to come to Ghana? Because, like a stress, don't you just want to come for holiday, you know? Yeah. But that's more on a personal that's side, okay. yeah. So if you took 100 people just mm -hmm. like you in Germany, how many of them do you say legitimately want to come to Ghana? <sighs> I have these kind of conversations with my friends, right? Um, a lot of them say, oh yeah, I would love to, I would love to, because a lot of our parents who, let's say, relocated to Europe in, let's say, the early 80s mm -hmm. or mid 90s, mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are also now moving back to Ghana, right? Okay. A lot of their parents. So um, some of them, I think, like the idea maybe but actually putting it into action is something else completely because it's a huge leap of faith to take especially in your mid-20s i okay. think so that's why i was happy to just have that kind of experience three months see how it is and that time around it wasn't even in my mind to relocate i was just like you know just go and do your experience All but right. um i think a lot of people like the idea of it but actually putting it into action is a completely different Okay. completely different story so five yeah. years from now ten years from now what will Chantel be doing in Ghana <laughs> so um, I've already told you about relocating but as mm. in like what exactly I'm going to do or which directly uh, direction I'm heading to I'm not yet ready to disclose okay and also I believe in um, I believe in sharing my results rather as in letting people know what I'm planning on doing. Okay. So you'll see me again, definitely. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll let you know, but... All right, so I nice. think uh, Chantel is going to be running for parliament and everything. <laughs> you never know. We'll you see. You never know. All right, so what advice do you have for young people in general? Uh, the reason why I ask is that you uh, you seem to have a very good take on things. Mm -hmm. What advice do you say to uh, do you have for people your age, both in the diaspora and those here? What advice would I give? Um, 
I would say something that I had to learn the hard way where mm -hmm. I wish someone would have given me some sort of advice is have patience, right? Have patience, be open-minded, and do not stress. I wish someone would have told me because the kind of stress that I put myself through was not necessary. And secondly, I would say um, there's a massive amount of potential that needs to be tapped in. There's conversations that are, that are necessary to be held between also local Ghanaians and diasporans relocating, right? And we should, we should be open for that. We should be open for that. We should be receptive, um, willing to learn, and really try and tap into that because I think the outcome and the results that we are going to earn from this are going to be amazing. And it excites me. Like, it really, really excites me thinking about what we could do if we bridge that kind of gap. So um, I would say it's, it's a lot about attitudes and behavior. Try and see the greater good, you know? Be patient. Be optimistic and just try because there's a lot of potential that we need to grasp on. If I were president, I would appoint you as the youth ambassador of Ghana right now so that you go and you recruit more young Ghanaians from Germany to Ghana. Amen. This has been a great conversation and uh, Chantel, it's been great. Like I Thank said, you very much. Was speaking with you. I feel like I'm speaking to a 60-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not that wise yet, so um, <laughs> no, you, I'm, you're trying, pretty I'm trying. You, you, pretty, you have a very good take on um, issues for someone your age. Thank you very and, much. And um, this has been Diaspora Weekly. My name is Jermaine Nkrumah. Uh, please visit our website, www.dntghana.com. Our Facebook page, Diaspora Network Television. Our YouTube page of same name, Instagram, visit us, like us. This is where we have the conversation between Ghana and her diaspora. And on behalf of my team, on behalf of my guests, I'd like to thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more of our programs.